This is part C of lecture 6 on descriptive statistics and Islamic approach. In this third part of the lecture, we will discuss the concept of a stochastic relationship between two variables. It requires new ways of thinking to think about a stochastic relationship. Most people make mistakes about it because we are used to thinking in terms of uh, one thing causes another thing. So we are used to thinking about relationships on an individual, one-to-one -one basis. I do X, it leads to Y. But in a stochastic relationship, the relationship does not exist in a one-to-one -one basis in individuals of the population. It in, exists at the aggregate level, on the group level only, not at the individual level. To give an example, Suppose that there is a, a disease which is deadly and without any treatment about half of the people recover and half of the people die. <clears throat> now a drug is invented such that 90% of the patients recover if they take the drug. So uh, this is an example of a stochastic relationship because the drug isn't guaranteed to cure. And the only thing it does is it makes um, recovery more likely than without the drug. In fact, uh, if 99% of the patient recover without the drug, then the same drug would be harmful. So in order to understand the stochastic relationship, you, you can't look at just what happens to the people who take the drug. You have to also look compare them with what happens to people who don't take the drug. Without that, you cannot understand the stochastic relationship. Now, two types of very common objections are made to this uh, concept of stochastic relationship. Um, people say that, look, if a thousand people have the disease, 500 of them recover without the drug. This means that the drug is not necessary for recovery. And similarly, people say that, look, these hundred people among the thousand took the drug and they did not recover. It means that the drug is not a cure. So both of these are objections which arise if you look at individual cases. Uh, but these objections can not be handled at the individual level. You, have, you can only handle them in the aggregate level when you look at the group as a whole, not at cases. So a stochastic relationship is not between two individuals X and Y but it is between X and the distribution of Y. It is not between the drug which was given to a patient and whether or not he recovered. It is between the drug which was given to all the patients and what happened to all of them as a whole. <clears throat> so we need to know what is the distribution of Y and this question becomes more important uh, because we are looking at relationship between X and distribution of Y. Now, in conventional statistics, this question has a clear and easy answer because we start out by assuming that the data has a, is a random sample from a hypothetical theoretical distribution. Normally, it is the normal distribution. So this distribution is the distribution of the data. But from the point of view that we are studying, we can't arbitrarily assume data to have a distribution. So this is not our understanding of how we uh, define the data distribution. Just for the record, we will provide a technical definition, even though we have not defined all of the terms required to understand it completely. We, a random sample from a population is an element of the population chosen in such a way that all members of the population have an equal chance of being chosen. So, I have my data, for example, in the highs, I have 15,509 house, households. Suppose I choose one household at random out of these 15,509 in such a way that all of them have an equal chance. This is a random sample. And now theoretically, the distribution of this random sample is the data distribution that we are going to work with in real statistics. Now. Uh, what this means fully, we'll, we will not be able to explain or understand right now. But a picture of this distribution is the his, data histogram, which we have been working with from the beginning of the course. Um, 
Now, the summary statistics for the distribution are the five quartiles, and these are what we have discussed earlier also. This understanding, we can answer the question of how the distribution of Y changes as X changes. We have already discussed the median line. It just shows how if you fix X at a certain value or within a certain range of values, and then you examine the median of the Y, and then you change the uh, values assigned to X, and then you examine how the median changes. So this is one aspect. This is one of the summary statistics of the distribution. And so this gives, tells you how the distribution is changing as X changes. Now in this part C, we will look at the mid-range. Uh, the mid-range is, is the middle half of the data. It is the, um, the data which goes from Q1, the first quartile, to the Q3. Now I should point out that this is a new use of the word mid-range. Uh, in the uh, usual literature, it is called, it, the mid-range is used for min plus max over 2, and this is also called the mid-extreme. We are assigning this word a new me meaning because this old meaning does not get used very often. It's not very useful. So we will illustrate what uh, the mid-range is and how it is used within the uh, context of a real-world example of the highest data set. This is incidentally also an important part of the methodology of real statistics. All theoretical concepts must be demonstrated and illustrated in by how they work in the real world. We cannot split off the theory from the practice and the applications. So we will now provide some details of how the mid-range is plotted of one variable against another in the highest data set example. Uh, the full technical details of how this is done in Excel are provided in a separate appendix. I will um, deal with some the um, elements of this just to understand what we are doing to the data, not to provide full Excel details of what exactly command we need to give in order to do exactly what needs to be done. That is done separately. But we do want to have an understanding of what exactly is needed to be done in order to create these quartile lines that we are, uh, we need to plot the mid-range. So the first step is to highlight the data. This is a difficult task because there are 15,509 points. So you can't just do it by pressing down arrow. Uh, there are, um, uh, there's an Excel command which uh, searches for the last element and highlights it which is described in detail. After you highlight the data, then you can sort it according to the first column. Again, there is a fixed built-in Excel command for sorting. When you sort according to the first column, the second column automatically gets sorted as well. And so that's convenient. And we proceed from after sorting the data according to household size. This is just to illustrate in greater detail what happens when you sort. Here we have uh, some data which has not been sorted according to household size. So the first element has 13 household size and 1966 as expenditure per capita. The second household is 18 members and 2576 expenditure per capita and so on. These are just the first 10 entries of the 15,000 uh, household data set. Now after you highlight this all and sort by the household size, then the first entry becomes sorted. So you look at the right panel. In row two, you have a household of size one, and it has expenditure per capita of 16,836. Um, so this entry was somewhere much later in this uh, original data set. But now, because it has a household of size one, it has been brought up into the top. But uh, note that the second entry, uh, so all of the households of size 1 occur first and then households of size 2 and then households of size 3. But what happens among the households of size 1? Well, within these households, those, um, those are also sorted according to the expenditure per capita. So the first household 
it has size one and income 16,836. The second one has size one and 21,256. So the expenditure cap per capita keeps increasing. This is what I mean by saying that the second column is also sorted. Now, if you go down to the 160th row, there are 159 households if, with, which have uh, size one. And so the first, the last few entries, you can see it's going up from 833,000 to 1,067,000 to 1.268,000,000. Uh, but now we uh, we come to the end of households of size one and we start on households of size two and now the sorting on the expenditure per capita begins again. Now the poorest household of size two spends 9,208 uh, uh, rupees per person in terms of its expenditure per capita and the second household spends 9,800 and so on. So there are uh, more than a thousand households of size two, and these are sorted according to uh, uh, according to the expenditure per capita in the second. And after this uh, two ends, then we start on households of size three, and then again we get uh, sorting according to the expenditure per capita. So now we have in our Excel spreadsheet each of the groups separated. The groups of size one are in one group and the groups house, household size of two are in a separate group and so on. If these were small data set, then we could do calculate the summary statistics for each of the subgroups uh, easily. But because these are large subgroups, we need to use some Excel tricks in order to be able to calculate the summary statistics for each of the uh, 20 groups according to the household size. Since the spreadsheet is so large, we need to locate where on the spreadsheet these groups are and we can't do it visually because it's too difficult it's too large so what we need to do is to determine the counts so there is a excel command called count if and if you apply it to the whole array from a1 to a2 to a 15510 and you ask how many entries are there which are less than or equal to one uh, excel tells you that there are 158 and since we have one header column, we add that, so we get 159. That is the row number at which the one entries end. Now then we want uh, to know when does do the entries for household size two end. And for that, we use the second command, which is shown here. Count if this array has a household size less than or equal to two. So that turns out to be 808. That the, so there are 808 households which are of size one or of size two. Both of these are counted. And that gives us 808 plus one for the header. So 809 is the, ent uh, is the row number at which uh, the last household of size two occurs. And similarly, 1840 is the row number for which the last household of size three occurs. So this is how we find out the um, the row at which the households of each particular size end. So once we've got the ending row, then it's easy to find out the grid numbers. Uh, the households are in uh, row in column A and the incomes, the expenditure per capita is in, in um, column B. So we can find out uh, where uh, each household size belongs. So this is uh, indicated in this uh, chart which I have made in Excel. So household size go from uh, A2 to A159 and their incomes goes from B2 to B159. And similarly, households of size 2 go from B160 to B808 and households of size 3 go from B809 to B1840. So this uh, calculation allows us to tell us the row number at which a particular household size starts and ends. So once we have both of those, then it's very easy to calculate the summary statistics. You just uh, apply it to the grid. For, so uh, for example, the households of size two go from B160 to B808. So we just take this uh, B160 colon B808 and we apply, we, we use the min command to find the minimum 
the quartile commands to find the three quartiles, which are Q1, Q2, and Q3, and the maximum to find the fifth quartile. So applying these commands gives us the three quartiles, which are uh, listed here up to household of size 20. Uh, the, the household size actually goes up to 61, but after 20, the number of households is very few. And as we have seen in plotting graphs, you don't want to go out too far into the tails because the most of the activity occurs between basically 1 and 15. And if you put a large number of um, at a high size households, then you won't be able to see this portion of the graph very well. So we split the household size and we put Q1 and Q3. This is the mid range or the middle half of the data. And Excel allows us to plot this easily. And this is the graph. And this shows us how the mid range changes as the household size increases. And we see that the mid range of the incomes is very high for low household sizes. And as the household size increase, uh, this comes down. And in particular, uh, the uh, after 10, it doesn't change very much. There are a few uh, squiggles, but uh, these could be due to uh, small amounts of data. Anyway, the point is that the mid range or the middle half of the incomes is quite high as you start with low number households. And it comes down rapidly, uh, but then it starts to go down slowly, and it basically becomes flat after 10. So the incomes of households are small for low size, and um, incomes are high at low sizes and go down. But this is a stochastic relationship. It is not true on a one-by-one -one basis. There you might be able to find a very poor household of size 1, and you may be able to find a very rich household of size 20. So if you think about the relationship on a one by one basis, you won't see it. You can only find this relationship at the group level. You can also go in the other direction, find out the distribution of the household size given the income. In this case, income isn't divided into neat groups like the household size is only one, two, and three. The income varies continuously. So in this case, we create groups. And we can just break up the whole data set into 20 equal groups. Uh, the whole data set consists of uh, 15,500 uh, households. So if you divide it into 20 groups, each group gets 775 people in it. So we just sort the data according to the income. And then we just take each group of 775 people as belonging to the same income group. This creates for us 20 income groups. And here I have listed the groups. The first group, the poorest group, has incomes going from, going from 1966 to 9,609. The second group has incomes going from 9,614 uh, to 11,220, and so on. This comes out from just sorting the data and then dividing it to, into 775 uh, size groups. To accommodate the extra nine households I have made, some of the groups be 776. Once we have the numbers of the rows for each group, then we can calculate the quartiles using the quartile command. In this case, the income per capita groups are in the column B, and the household size is in column A. And now I want to calculate what happens to the distribution of the household size as we fix the income. So we look at A2 to A7776. This is the first, the poorest uh, uh, households. And we look at, we apply the quartile command to A2 to A776. And Excel tells us that the first quartile is 7, second quartile is 9, and the third quartile is 11. This means that the median household size is 9 for the poorest families. Uh, the first quartile is 7, means that and the last third quartile is 11. So 25% of the family have more than 11. And similarly, we, we go from 777 to 1552 and so on. Um, each group has about 775 people and we calculate the quartiles. And this is the, uh, these are the numbers that Excel tells us. We make an XFI plot of the average income within one bucket and then uh, compare uh, and, and look at the mid-range of household size. And you can see that the 
household size as the incomes increase the household size the mid range of the household size comes down so in general this shows us that the household size are lower for larger income but again this is a relationship which holds in distribution it's a stochastic relationship it holds on the average it doesn't hold for any particular case so you can have very rich households which are also have large household sizes and you can have very poor families which are very small household sizes so in on individual basis things can go against the general pattern the general pattern is only available in the group one more thing that's clear from the graph is that once the household size become once the income becomes large enough then the household size is not affected more by further increase in income so the pattern stabilizes after you are rich enough so to conclude what do we learn from this uh, discussion of stochastic relationships we understand that the stochastic relationship is a relationship between the value of x and the distribution of y the median line is one type of a stochastic relationship it tells us where half of the data where the uh, where the line which divides the upper half from the lower half is so it's telling us about the group as a whole um, plotted against the value of the other variable uh in this uh, lecture we looked at the middle half of the data or the mid range of the data and that lies between the q1 and the q3 lines half of the population is between these two lines 25% is below the q1 and 25% is above the q3 so again this provides a picture of the distribution the mid range is actually a picture of the spread of the data around the median how how far away does it go is it very narrowly concentrated or is it is very spread out so we saw that the household size and the incomes are very spread out <laughs> in the early picture but become less spread out as you go down further along the graph